What's good, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over Quota. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. My Boston accent came up there for a second. Over Quota. That's better. All right. <laughs> My goal for this interview is to give anyone who's looking for another opportunity insight and advice from someone who is paid to make recruiting and hiring decisions. Um, so hopefully, as a result of this interview and others, you'll be a better candidate and increase your likelihood of separating yourself from others from in getting the job, all right? Now, as always, the J. David Group is sponsoring this podcast, which is my company, of course, uh, which helps high growth software companies recruit top software sales leaders and salespeople. So go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash hiring to learn more or go to the jdavidgroup.com forward slash looking if you're looking for your next big challenge. My guest today is Natasha Farouk. She is the global talent acquisition lead for Axiom XL, which is the world's number one platform for risk and regulatory reporting. Natasha, welcome to Overquota. Thank you, Jay. So let's just start there, if, if, if you will. Talk to me a little bit about um, Axiom and Axiom XL, SL, sorry, and uh, in your role there. Absolutely. So Jay, as you alluded, um, I'm the global talent acquisition lead. So my role encompasses leading talent acquisition, which is recruitment for 20 plus countries at Axiom. So we're located all over the world. We're located in Europe, in Asia, um, in North America, especially. And so we do hire a lot of positions and we're very fortunate right now during these unprecedented times to be hiring right now. And so uh, we'll talk about that later, but lots of sales positions, executive roles, finance uh, roles, as well as technology. So um, Axie Macelle, like you mentioned, is the number one leader in risk and regulatory software. And so we have primarily financial and global clients. So just to name a few that you'll see on our website, like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, uh, we work with financial institutions that have trillions of dollars of assets. And so we provide those software solutions to uh, companies like them so that they can be regulatory in this type of environment. So we've been operating in this space for almost 30 years. And so definitely we are the leaders in that. Um, so yeah, looking forward to talking more about that later. And tell me about how your um, talent team is structured internally. Absolutely. So we've been significantly growing since last year. And so my role was a newly added or created position mm -hmm. to lead the global environment, and especially in terms of recruitment, to look at what we're doing in terms of metrics, in terms of reporting, in terms of how we can be more agile in today's workforce as well and proactive in reaching out to uh, candidates. So this is a great topic, especially even now because we are 100% remote. Um, but certainly in terms of that, you know, my role is also to lead, mentor, coach, and manage um, our recruitment team across the globe. So in each of our regions, we have our HR leads. And so they lead the entire HR function. And a part of that, of course, a really big part of that is the recruitment function as well. So it really depends, but we have a pretty large uh, HR team, uh, almost up to 15 people. And in North America specifically, we have very specific roles because that is where we're headquartered. So we have like an HR manager here on staff. Uh, we also have a generalist. We also have a global payroll manager as well. And so we're continuing to grow our team across the globe. I'm just curious, before we get into some of the tactics that I know that um, candidates or, or would-be candidates are curious about, how many employees um, do you guys have roughly around yeah, the globe? Absolutely. We have about 1,000 employees, and I'll say that we're still continuing to grow. So adding to that number, uh, even in this environment in 2020. So yeah, almost 1,000 people. Awesome. Okay, cool. So let's get into, and, and why I'm so passionate about this is, first of all, I've, I've been doing this podcast since February before the pandemic. And then obviously, as you see, every Thursday, new numbers come out and increasingly uh, people are finding themselves without work. And one of the things that I wanted to add to this podcast is voices like yours to help candidates who may have just found themselves in a situation where they need to find another role, but then realize that, you know, they don't really know how to break through the clutter, even though they have, they have high level of skill. Um, they, um, you know, they perhaps do are confident when they interview in the whole nine yards, but there are certain things that they just don't really know how to get going and get started or even to which direction to, to go in, I guess. So I guess the first question I have is, for you, if you were in a situation where you needed to find another job or even wanted to find another job, whichever, okay. um, how would you start? What were the first couple of things, I guess, that you'd do to get going? Yeah. 
Um, so just one, one thing, and I just want to mention, even though I'm a talent professional and I've been doing this for 15 years, I mean, I've been on the other side of the table too, right? I've been interviewing for positions and been finding uh, roles in my career as well. So, you know, anything that I say, you know, is true to any candidate. And so the first thing that I do, I mean, whether I'm employed or whether, you know, I've lost a job, unfortunately, in this environment is to take a moment to reflect. So really thinking about, you know, where you are right now in your career, take a step back and before just diving into all your applications, because you may regret it later. You may say two days from now, well, I should have said that in a cover letter or in hindsight, I should have mentioned that. So taking a moment to reflect, I think that that's really important because you should really know who you are, what you want, and what is your value proposition, right? So the second step and a part of that is to do research. I mean, we are so blessed that we live in a global era and it's a digital economy. So we have access to things at our fingertips. So there are articles from Indeed or The Ladder or Glassdoor, and, and it talks about market research, about which companies are hiring, what is the culture of a company. So do your research on what company that you do want to apply for. Because one of the things that really solidifies an application is when we find out that a candidate doesn't only want a job, but they want a career with us. So we want that message to come across loud and clear in your resume, in your cover letter, in your interviews. So once you have that and you're grounded about that, that's the time to start your application. Um, the other thing, of course, I mean, a resume, um, they say that a resume is really truly like almost only 2% of your application, but obviously you need a resume to get started. So thinking about what you want to put in your resume, how do you summarize your experience? And remember that it is your roadmap of who you are and everything that you've done. It is a living document of everything. So that's the first step. Um, and then, you know, comes the application process and other things that you can focus on. One thing you just mentioned to me, which I want to follow up on, is you said um, career focused. Tell me why that needs to come through and you know, why, why, why that's so important to you um, from a hiring side? Yeah, so, you know, we've always heard like, you know, recruitment is like a two-way street, right? And mm -hmm. we want to know that when we hire a candidate, you are in long-term investments. We're going to take the time to invest in you and we want you to take the time to invest in us. So when we, you know, are interviewing and we come across concerns like you're jumping too much from job to job, you know, you're jumping for the wrong reasons. That's a concern. That's a red flag for us. So we want to make sure that you fit in our culture and environment for the long run. And from a professional development perspective, we're also able to invest in you. So career focused and oriented candidates always take a precedent over those saying, hey, I just want a job, you know, because six months from now, when a better opportunity comes around, they may be a flight risk at that time. That's right. And so let me just ask you this then. Job hopping has always been a red flag, right? It's always a concern. What if someone has, you know, over the last, say, two or three jobs or two or three, let's say they've had, I don't know, three jobs in the last two years or five jobs in the last six or seven years or something like that. Their resume just looks choppy like that. But then they, they come to you or something that, which is, I'm assuming this is, this is probably hard to articulate on a resume. So let's just jump ahead to um, just sort of, being a candidate, I guess, holistically before we get back to the resume, um, how can th they navigate that choppy water as they're trying to tell you, yes, I am career oriented, but yet these hiccups that I've had in the, in the past were just those, they were just hiccups. Like, what are you listening for? Or what do you want to hear, I guess, from them to give you confidence that it's okay to take a risk on them? So yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. I get that all the time. And, uh, I would say a very big reason why hiring managers don't pursue candidates is that they're concerned that they've hopped around too much. They're like, I don't even want to look at this resume or candidate because they've had a job every year or six months. And if we hire this person, I can't rely on this individual to stay on the team. And so I don't want to pursue that person. So there's different ways of going about that. Um, I've seen in resumes that candidates have mentioned when they're looking at their experience saying, this was a contract role. So they actually mention in their experience, like, okay, I was at ABC company, contract. I was at this company, reason for leaving, position was eliminated. Mm. Uh, this company, you know, reason for leaving, better opportunity. So you can actually highlight that in your resume. I have seen that. It helps because at this stage, when I'm looking at your resume, I'm not able to connect with you and ask you those questions. The other thing is, don't forget the importance of a cover letter. 
So a resume is factual. It's, it has everything that you have done, right, in terms of facts, your experience, your education, your skills, your certifications. But a cover letter is who you are and what you want to portray and, and, and the reason why you're interested in this company and the job itself. So really highlighting why you're interested, what your career has looked like, and what your future aspirations are, that could be easily covered in a cover letter as well. Should the cover letter be a separate document that they're attaching, or should it be a cover email that introduces their resume? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a lot of different schools of thought on that. There's no one right response, but if a cover letter is required, you have a cover letter, and it should be a separate document. And again, you know, try to keep it really concise, and it should be individualized to the company and to the job. So having just a generic cover letter can actually do more harm than good. So I would say uh, as an advice, please make sure that you have the company name, you have the company address in there, you have the reason for motivation. It's, it's basically your motivation letter, right? Why you're interested in this job. Mm -hmm. So why are you interested in joining us and what value can you add? Again, what results can you bring? So whereas in a resume, let's say in a sales position, you have all your sales director jobs um, listed, but in a cover letter, you could say in my last job, I increased revenue by this much. I worked on you know, thousands of dollars here. I worked across the globe in six different countries. And for this specific opportunity, I already have a network built in so-and-so, and I'm able to do that. A lot of senior executives as well mentioned sort of their uh, goal for their 90-day plan, saying, look, if I get this opportunity with you, this is what I plan to do in the first 90 days, which is really smart because it shows us that they're being extremely proactive in their approach. How do you define, this might be a tough question, but I'll ask it anyway. How sure. do you define concise? When I tell people concise, it's always, I'm always afraid to say it because then I don't want them to be short. I want them to be concise. Like how do you, how do you define concise? Absolutely. Um, so I would say concise is being relevant. Okay. And so if you have relevance in the information that you are providing, it's great. So for example, in a cover letter, if you're mentioning the same things that are in your resume, it's just a waste of space. And so really take the time to put things in a format that's easily readable to the audience. Usually it's the hiring manager or it's the HR person. And I would recommend even having bullet points. So just like we see a job description, I would say if you look at a job description and that's what it is on the left-hand side, and then you look at a resume, how do they match? Mm. So if the job description says five years of experience, you know, um, maybe I have to look at your resume in detail to understand that you have five years of experience in an executive role in sales management in the Europe region. But you can clearly mention that, that I'm interested in this position, so I have 10 plus years of experience, I've done so and so. So again, making sure it's very relevant. Um, and the other thing I'd say is make sure that it isn't more than two pages because it does get lost in applicant tracking systems. I know we're going to dive more into that, but the more words that you have, the more convoluted it's going to get. So usually for a cover letter, it is recommended to have one page and there's different ways that you can do this. You can have links to your portfolio or things like that as well. So if someone's more interested, they can go and click on those links. I want to ask this question before I forget, even though we'll get into applicant tracking systems a little bit, but something I didn't, I wasn't aware of. So when somebody sends the, uh, or, attaches their cover letter to the application, that their cover letter actually gets uh, parsed as well into the applicant tracking system? Okay. Most applicant tracking systems will do that. Mm -hmm. And so when you do a search, let's say, you know, I have an applicant tracking system, I have 500 applicants, mm -hmm. and I put in, let's say, a certain company that I know is very competitive in this market, and I put that as my search word, if it's in your cover letter or if it's in your resume, it's going to generate that result. But your application has those key words. So absolutely, um, usually, you know, you want it in a uh, Microsoft Word or a PDF format, which is really friendly. I say PDF is better because the formatting doesn't get lost because a lot of applicant tracking systems, when we see resumes parsed, it's all a jumble of words. So with a PDF, it's kind of locked, that formatting. Okay, good. I hope you guys are paying attention because he's dropping some knowledge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hit the 30 second back button if you missed that and listen to it again. <laughs> um, the, I want to talk a little bit about the, the summary for a minute. Tell me why the summary is so important um, on a resume. Yeah, so I've seen it all. I've seen long five-page curriculum by kids like big CVs. I've seen a one-page 
entry level graduate resume, um, I would say again, the relevance is really important. So if you have an objective or a summary saying, I am looking for a great career opportunity in sales, I mean, that's not strong enough. I mean, what does that mean? Like, what is it that you're going to do? You know, what, how do you summarize yourself? So I prefer a professional summary or highlight of accomplishments. When I see all this information, if the first thing that I see, the first five seconds, I lay my eyes on your resume and I see five plus years of experience in this, work in so-and-so sectors, certified in so-and-so, advanced proficiency in XYZ software skills. It literally is a beautiful summary of everything that you've done in five top bullet points. Mm. It's kind of like your elevator speech in writing. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be able to capture that. Instead of me going back to your second page and kind of counting the years of experience and what you've done, that's what you're able to highlight in the first half of your resume. So I think summary is really important, but the whole big paragraph summary is, is a deterrent sometimes because we don't have the time to actually go through that in detail and read every line that you have. Got it. And I know we've talked about it a little bit, but when someone's so, all right, so somebody submits their resume, they submit their cover letter online, it goes through wherever, right? Whether it's direct on your website or it's, it's fed through something that you guys have posted somewhere like ZipRecruiter or Indeed, um, it goes in and it goes to the applicant tracking system. And then how does it get like routed? You mentioned, you know, the, the HR managers and all the recruiters that you have, how does it get routed? And then how do humans interact with the software? Just give us an overview of how that actually yeah. works. Um, we live in a very digital world and our applicant tracking systems are very advanced now. And so there's different ways of like how hiring managers and recruiters are actually managing that process. So it's really interesting. So I would say, first of all, I encourage you to go to Glassdoor and read more about their interview process and what they do and how many people they interview and what kind of questions and experiences they have. Uh, but the second thing about that is making sure that again, your resume is concise. So once we receive that information, I'm probably going to see a list of 150 applicants, right? And maybe I don't have time to go through all 150 applicants, but I know, I know in a technology role, I need Java. I need, you know, another skill SQL, let's say, and I need, you know, a skill in, let's say, um, something else that's really relevant. Um, let's say a company or a degree, like I'll say bachelor's in, you know, software development or software development life cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have those words, it's not going to pop up necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I'll see that. And so let's say I have the 150 resumes, I'll see the top 20 resumes that have those keywords. And it's usually a combination. One thing uh, that we use is called Boolean search. And so Boolean search is a way for us to, you know, combine search words and key terms to get the result that we really need uh, from that candidate uh, application. So then usually a recruiter, they're working on this, uh, shares that information with the hiring manager and the hiring manager usually provides a short list to say, great, these 20 candidates are great, but I want to interview these five people. So we do go through those resumes. Um, the last thing I'd say is timing is really key. When you're applying for jobs, very important because if you're in the top 100 applications, you know how you get that message from LinkedIn saying, you want to be on the top, you know, go and purchase an addition license or pay for it because you do want to be on the top, you know, of the applications. Mm. And so timing is very key. Be on top of it. Um, applicant tracking systems also allow you to get notifications when a job similar to your background is open. So make sure that you have your application ready and typically apply within the first week of it being posted. Very interesting. So it sounds to me like there's a legitimate case for a resume to get lost. In other words, just because I submit it doesn't mean that someone's going to see it because if you, again, to your point, you have 150 resumes in there, let's just say, and, or applicants, and you're clearly, you're not going to go through all of them and neither is any human being. You're going to shortcut it by looking for some of the keywords and things that are most important to you. If somebody is submitting that and those their resume and cover letter and they don't have any of those things, they're not going to get seen. And then they're probably not even, they're not even going to get a rejection letter. They're just going to be wondering like what happened to my application, right? Right. Right. So I'm going to say that I'm going to respond to this from a candidate perspective. Okay. I see a job and I know I'm the perfect fit. I'm like, this is it. This is my dream job. This is everything that I've done. There is no way I'm not going to get an interview and I don't get a response. And I'm like disheartened. I'm like, gosh, you know, I really wanted this job. Probably because I applied too late. 
So as an HR team and hiring manager as a committee, if you've applied three weeks late and you're already in second and technical interviews, your resume is not going to be considered for that role because you've been late in applying for that process. Now, um, I would say big HR teams and, and really large companies, I wouldn't say that you're lost because you're still in our database. So in the future, if there is a role that you're interested in your background, I will go in my database and search for those key terms again. And if your resume is that strong, we'll get to it. Uh, one of the things that recruiters are doing, but I think we're notorious for not doing, is sending declination emails and letters. But again, then you still don't know why you weren't selected, right? So it's really important. Again, timing is very key. So if you don't apply within the first week or so, it actually may get lost and you may not be considered for that job. As part of the, you mentioned timing and that, you know, if, 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 if the company's already in second and third rounds, let's just say of, of, of interviews, is it that your team isn't even looking for those candidates anymore? They're not even considering it because you're focused on something else that is a more of a priority because you have your shortlist, right? Perhaps your finalists that are in there. And so nobody's even searching for this person anymore, even though the job is still quote unquote open, it's just, they're not going to get found. Or is it because you see them, but you're like, eh, you know what? We don't want to slow this recruitment process down. We don't want to muddy the waters, so to speak, right? We already know that the hiring managers love these two or three. We don't want to, you know, enter, interject some sort of um, paralysis analysis where they're like, oh, okay, now we want to see this candidate. Like, what is it? Tell me what meant, what, what goes on in the decision-making there? It's a combination of both, Jay. I mean, so let, let me give you a real life example. Mm -hmm. I have a role I'm recruiting for. We've been recruiting for this position for two months. We've interviewed several candidates. We've invested a lot of time. We've invested a lot of time in terms of interviews, testing, assessment, sharing with the executive team. And now we're in the final stages where we have two vetted candidates. Would I introduce a new candidate at this stage in the hiring process? Probably not. Now, as a recruiter that takes pride in my work, and, and I encourage all recruiters and talent professionals to do so, they may say, let me just take one step, one quick look again at the rest of the applicants to make sure we are hiring the best talent, right? Um, and if there is someone that relevant, usually I'll just share that with the hiring manager and say, I know we're in the final stage here, but there is this one candidate that really stands out. And usually the response is, that's great, but I'm very interested in the person that we spent two, three weeks interviewing let's keep that person on the back burner for now. Yes. yes, that's usually the response. Yes, that's right. Okay. What about, you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you're, you're apply for a job, you know, you're the perfect fit for it and you don't get it right. Or you don't even get a response, right? You just, it's mm -hmm. just, it just doesn't respond. What is your thought or advice on candidates um, sending their resume directly to the hiring manager or if they can't find who the hiring manager is directly to someone on your team who looks like the person that might be the person hiring for the hiring manager. <laughs> like yeah, if they can yeah. find, like what, what are your thoughts with that? You know, I can say that right now in my LinkedIn inbox, I probably have two, 300 pending invitations and messages. I don't always get to them, but if I get to a message and, and the message is, please look at my resume and let me know if I'm a fit for this job, that's not very proactive. Um, the first thing I'll be like, did you apply for this position online? So first of all, I mean, in terms of the process, we want to respect that company's process. So please do apply for that position online before reaching out to anybody in that company to say, I formally submitted my interest in application. I am looking for feedback because I really think that I'm qualified because of the, these two top reasons. So I think it's fine to reach out. Um, you may not always get a response on LinkedIn as well. Um, from an HR perspective, I mean, I do value that. I do look at that and I do respond and say, look, um, we're really further ahead in the application process at this time. We're not considering new applications. Um, but yeah, I mean, be proactive. You have LinkedIn, reach out to hiring managers or reach out to HR, uh, you know, staff as well in that company to get that feedback. Um, but if you're late, most likely you're just not going to be considered for that role. Timing is everything. It's an old adage Absolutely. across the board for many different things. Um, including investing. Um, <laughs> guys, if you're listening to this in your car or the gym or multitasking or whatever, we're going to start sharing uh, Nat Natasha's screen in a minute because uh, I want to her to uh, show you the LinkedIn recruiters. This will be on YouTube as well. So you'll have to eventually get to a computer and look at it on YouTube. But before I get into that, just one other question regarding that, uh, those messages that you have sitting in there. Um, I'd be curious to see it in LinkedIn too as well, but um, 
is there a particular subject line or like you mentioned like, oh yeah, just whatever, I forget the example you gave, but it wasn't necessarily going to get your attention. Is there something that they should put in the subject line or in the first line of their email that grabs your attention to say, okay, I'm going to, this was, this one's worth opening or worth reading. Yeah. So I prefer if you've applied online to mention the actual title of that position that you're interested in because it gives me a reference point, right? It's an internal reference point. Um, applicant tracking systems have something called a unique identifier. And a unique identifier is basically the job ID number or the job requisition number. So that is usually on an application when you apply. And so, for example, as a global organization, Jay, if I'm looking at 200 jobs alone, not even candidates, 200 jobs, and someone's like, I'm interested in the sales role. I don't know which sales role you're interested in. There's maybe 200, you know, applications even for one sales role. So mentioning sales executive dash four, five, six, eight, five, you know, I'm, I'm, I've applied for this position, very interested in this because of this reason, would it be possible to connect or share my background and experiences for this role? Keeping it very concise, very direct. And if I'm interested, I'll look at your LinkedIn profile. And if I'm further interested, I'll definitely open up that application with your name and under that requisition or ID number. Fantastic. Okay, great. That's great advice. That's great advice. Okay, would you mind um, showing? Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Cool. Fantastic. Perfect. If everyone can see my screen here, um, I'm going to open up what we call the LinkedIn Talent Solutions page. And so this is really great. I just kind of pre-populated a search here just so everyone can see. Look at all the fields that I can search with. Wow. Think about this. This is everything that you have on your LinkedIn. If your LinkedIn is not complete, literally your resume, your application, or your profile will not pop up. So this is an inside look. And applicant tracking systems work very similarly. In fact, LinkedIn has its own applicant tracking system, and this is very similar to how it looks. So let's say I'm looking for a sales director, I'm looking for a regional sales manager, and I'm looking for that person in New York City. There's 69,000 results just for that. That's crazy. Now, if in your spotlights, in LinkedIn, you basically said that you are open to new opportunities, you have reduced that. And I know that you're looking for a job and there's 10,000 people here. So again, there's so much in terms of years of experience, you can also look at that. And so I'm like, oh, this is a very senior role. I need someone with 10 to 20 you know, years of experience. And so I go ahead and update that and it goes to 3,900 results. Mm -hmm. Then I say, wait, you know what? And look at LinkedIn, it already starts to populate. In your skills and assessments, you have the opportunity to mention what are your top five skills. These are technical skills, right? But also your competencies. So really, again, remember that reflection phase? Really mm -hmm. think about what you stand for and what your value proposition is. I'm like, no, I definitely need business development, right? Okay, further to that, what I wanna do is I need somebody from the IT sector. And here you go. I am down to 184 results. Mm -hmm. So how cool is that? I started off with 60,000 and I'm down to 184 based on your skills, the titles you have, and possibly even the search words and keywords that I can enter here. So again, if your LinkedIn profile is not complete, if your resumes don't have specific keywords, and it isn't clear, your resume will not come up in the 184 results. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and the, the key takeaway that I want people to, to get um, from there is a couple of things. Natasha had mentioned to make sure that your resume or right, your resume and your LinkedIn profile are just robust, right? That they, that you don't take shorts, that you include everything. If you, if it's a skill, if you've done it, um, if it's something of value that you can add, then you want to make sure that you include it in your resume and include it in your LinkedIn profile. But I think the bigger picture here is if, if let's say, for instance, somehow you just sort of glossed over that, right? It's the thing that she showed at first, which is 69,000 plus candidates um, for a particular function, so to speak, right? And human beings, no matter how earnest we are about getting the job done and wanting to do it right and all this other stuff. It's just not humanly acceptable or possible to manually go through 69,000 people. So our inclination, and I'm saying this power because this what she was showing is exactly how I think too as well, right? It's 
you have to you're you're trying to get to the what do they call it like the center of the lollipop so to speak right <laughs> as quickly as um possible and so you're for all intents and practical purposes excluding all of the things that um you know are going to prevent you from doing that right and you're including by contrast the people and you're rewarding the people who have taken taken the time to fill out their resumes and by the way taking the time to, to fill out your LinkedIn profile so it's robust, right? So that you tell the world that you are um, looking for new opportunities and just those types of things also says that you're probably um, a higher grade candidate because you are showing attention to detail. You're, thinking, you're looking at it more professionally. You're looking at it like your business, right? Especially if you're a salesperson. Uh, these are things that you want to be doing strategically uh, that hopefully when you get the job, you're going to be doing some strategic thinking as well in terms of breaking down accounts, getting into accounts, engaging new accounts, growing existing, those types of things. So that's to me um, why that's really, really important, you know? And, and Jay, further to that, not to get too granular, but I think it's helpful information, applicant tracking systems also recommend resumes now, including LinkedIn. When I post a job, LinkedIn will tell me, we recommend, so LinkedIn has its own automated recruiter that actually tells you that these are the profiles that match the requirements of your job. I was in my applicant tracking system today and it basically said the automated recruiter basically uh, took like 50 profiles and said, please do look at these 50 profiles from your database because they match the job description. So again, those keywords and making sure it's individualized to the company, to their terms, to that job description is very important. Yeah, and a couple of things too to point out uh, there is that when your LinkedIn profile is mapped to an applicant tracking system, because Natasha showed me this, um, you know, outside of this call, but you can see that your image comes up. And if you don't have an image, then guess what? Your image isn't coming up. And that's just, that's, that's just not a good look, literally and figuratively. Um, and then also that little space, I don't know if they call it your headline or the byline or something yes. like that, but make yeah. sure that that's a strong statement there, right? Um, because you, that, that might be all you get, right? <laughs> it might be, they might pull you up and say, you know, they might make a move to move on from you or to say, you know what, I'm going to engage with this person just based on that headshot and that little headline, so to speak, that they have about themselves, right? 100%. That tagline is very important. Putting in a summary of what's your, what, what is, what is your ideal role? Like, are you a talent professional? Are you a sales executive? Are you an experienced marketer? So, so really think about what that tagline is. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So let's say you're strategic and smart enough to do all of those things. And um, now you're, um, I'll call it lucky enough, uh, given how large the numbers are, you're lucky enough to get the call, right? Or the email to say, we want to um, invite you for some sort of an interview. Tell me, what, how should people prepare for that first sort of phone screen, I guess, if you will, or, or a Zoom screen. And then, you know, what would you be evaluating um, in that 30 or 45 minute call um, to right. get something out yeah, of the candidate? Yeah, absolutely. So just to combine that, and I know there's so much research out there and what you can do in terms of company research and reading the mm -hmm. job description, but I wanna take it to another level and, and, and give a little tip um, that you can do. So I'm going to interview you, let's say, for example, Jay, um, you're my candidate for a sales executive role, and you're going to have the job description up most likely in front of you, and I'm going to have this resume, your resume in front of me. I'm literally going to ask you questions tailored to that job description. So how are you going to respond in terms of, I'm looking for 10 years of experience in this. I'm looking for an experienced leader in this market. So really think about, you know, the examples that you can give through the work that you've done, through your personal accomplishments. One of the things that I see a lot in job descriptions or responses is people start talking about their job description, but you come from a team of 15 people. So that means all 15 people in that company, in that team, did the same thing. But what differentiates you? What did you do? Did you work on a specific project? Did you produce a specific output? You know, did you receive an award for doing something? So really think about what makes you stand out on that team, in that company, for this application. Because, you know, I see your resume. So what now can you offer me in terms of a response, in terms of output and results that you're able to accomplish in this role? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And what about, how much weight do you put on 
say that which would be a hard skill versus a soft skill, which might be signs of resiliency or accountability and those types of yeah. things. Give me a sense of yeah. how you'd break that down. So the reason why you have an interview is because you have the technical skills. And the reason why that I want to speak with you is I want to know that you have the soft skills. I think that's the best way to look at it. So right now in this environment, we're having a Zoom conversation. I want to know your personality. Uh, I want to gauge if you're a good culture fit. I want to gauge if you have excellent communication skills. I know you mentioned it on your resume, you have excellent communication skills, but now is your time to shine and show that through this interaction. So your soft skills are going to come across in the interview and less in a resume. So in an interview, the first five minutes in a phone screen, maybe just focus on what are your salary expectations? Why are you looking for this job uh, or a job? Or why are you interested in this opportunity? Then let's dive into your experience. How are you going to communicate? You know, Jay, it's less of what the person has to say sometimes, because I already know they have that experience. It's about how they communicate that and how they get that message across. So again, it's very important to be able to relay that information and, and, and showcase your personality and why you should actually hire you. What are some of the biggest mistakes that candidates make on that phone initial phone screen or Zoom screen? Well, Zoom is interesting um, <laughs> right now. So be prepared, um, have a quiet space if you can. I just had an interview yesterday. The person was walking upstairs and I asked, I said, is this still a good time for us to connect? And the person said, yes. I had constant interruptions. I couldn't hear the person. They were out of breath. Um, and it just shows me this person didn't take the time to actually, you know, take this seriously. And they're not serious about this job application. Hmm. And then very brief responses. So again, be prepared mentally. Block off like a half an hour before your interview. Go through this. And then have it be a conversation. Because remember one thing, if you have nerves and you're talking to a recruiter, we want you as much as you want to be in this company. And we want you to be a part of our culture and environment. So, so we're interviewing you as much as you should be interviewing us as well. So remember that as well, because we're looking for excellent candidates like yourself. Um, so be prepared, uh, be professional. And one advice I can give in this environment is treat it just like any in-person interview. Like you're walking in and you literally are talking to somebody face-to-face -face in a conference room. So take it as seriously as an in-person interview. Just because it's Zoom doesn't mean it's less serious. Yeah, the only thing missing is the handshake, which will probably go away. <laughs> which will probably exactly. go away entirely anyway. There's not going to be any more handshakes. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's a great. That's a great tip for Zoom. Maybe they'll come up with a virtual handshake. <laughs> exactly, that's right. A virtual yeah. handshake, little virtual tap. Oh my goodness. Um, how quickly? That always interests me. That that uh, the soft skills aspect of the interview. And you described the person going up the stairs and being out of breath and talking very brief, you know, brief answers and those types of things really being short. How quickly did you know into that interview that this person was not going to be a good fit? Immediately. In the first one minute. <laughs> right. And then I was like, no, it's my, so, so recruiters and HR individuals, they are the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. That's how I consider recruiters. We open the gate to allowing applicants to come in and you share those with the hiring managers. So we are giving you every benefit of the doubt to do an excellent job in your interview. And we, I am probing because we are professional interviewers. Hiring managers probably aren't, right? They interview for their jobs here and there when they have a great business. But we want to sell you to the hiring manager. We want to give you every opportunity. So I did. I probed this individual. I said, tell me more. You know, explain a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more about your job and what you're doing and, and why you're interested. And the person failed to do so because probably they were uh, distracted and they were not prepared to have that conversation. So again, I knew, but I kept giving them the benefit of the doubt. And phone screens typically can be anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 minutes. I want to give the courtesy of a 10 minute interview and go to that person's background because we did schedule a time. That person has taken an interest in our job and company as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is your opportunity to really be prepared and come across as very strong in your application. Can I ask how you, how did you end that interview? How did it end? You know, I said, thank you for your time. You know, you have a great uh, background, but certainly we'll follow up with the hiring manager and let you know if we're interested in moving you forward. And I always say just because I'm busy and I know that HR people are notorious for not getting back to candidates, I always end with, if I don't follow up with you, please feel free to follow up with me. And I'm happy to respond to that. And I usually do. 
I usually just get, send a one line quick response because I will send an email at the very end of the application process if we're not pursuing your background. But during that time, the person may be wondering like what happened? Like I haven't heard back in a month. Mm -hmm. So I usually don't commit to that, but I say, please feel free to follow up. And it also gives me an opportunity to see how much initiative they are taking. Mm -hmm. And I love it during the application process when candidates reach out or they ask because it is your right to ask about your application. So don't shy away from that. I wouldn't send an email right away after a day, but in a week. And candidates can also ask, like, when can I follow up on this? And when will you know about the next steps? Did you, did I just hear you correctly? In other words, you won't, even that person won't necessarily know that they're not being considered anymore until the position is filled all the, or yeah, I guess filled. Is that how it works? Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. Um, or I know that I have solid candidates moving forward to the second and third round of interviews. So, I mean, you know, we have a lot of jobs. We have a lot of regions here and many recruiters have thousands of applications to manage. So mm -hmm. candidate management is a very big piece of training for HR, you know, uh, practitioners in this field and space. Mm -hmm. So take the initiative, follow up because you may have another offer. You know, um, a lot of times candidates will reach out to me and say, I'm moving forward in an application process for another company and I anticipate an offer in a week. Could you please let me know my status? And I love that. I'm like, great. You know, I don't want to waste this person's time and I'll respond right away. Yep. Got it. Got it. Um, what should the, you mentioned that the person should ask something to the effect of, you know, what are next steps and, the, and when, when can I expect to hear back? We also mentioned that they should show interest in the role, right? Did that person that you were that you alluded to did did you ask if that person had any questions, or at that point you didn't even it didn't matter whether or not they had questions? No, I always ask. I mean, it's it's okay. a common courtesy to always leave at least a few minutes at the end of the conversation to do that. The person didn't have any questions. Actually, in fact, um, this is another example. Somebody else had a question. So, can you tell me more about the job? So, I mean, that's great, but what do you <laughs> want to know about the job? So, so for me, my, my, my response and, and internal response is, what more do you want to know about the job? Do you want to know about uh, the 90 day plan around this job? Do you want to know the strategic objectives in our team? Do you want to know uh, the organizational structure? Do you want to know the, the, the team dynamics of this job? Basically, you probably haven't done your research and are just asking me to talk about the job. And I'm happy to do so, and I do dive into it, and then I ask, do you have any other questions? So again, be prepared to ask specific questions about the job that correlate to you as well. And, and the way, very smart responses are, you know, I have so-and-so experience in this technology, will I be utilizing that? And will I have an opportunity for leadership roles in the future if I get this license as well? How does your company respond to that? So very specific geared questions are smart questions. Are there any questions that, um, job related questions that are off limits? Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of legality. It depends on which, uh, we're a global organization. I've worked in global roles before, so it really varies, but there are some ground rules. like. You don't want to ask about nationality. You don't want to ask about things like, you know, specific, uh, you know, things about the job that are not relevant again. And, and you'll get those responses. And if you are an excellent candidate, also keep in mind, you will get the opportunity to talk to other individuals on the team. And so you'll be able to ask those questions. Um, you know, what, 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 I wouldn't say off limits, Jay. I just say sometimes what the questions that you get are like, oh, um, so, in, you know, um, if I work in this company, what, can I be promoted in six months? You know, um, what is the typical salary increase? And I'm not saying it's a wrong question, but it shows that your motivation, perhaps, is to immediately just get promoted in this role. And what message does that give to the hiring manager? This person may be difficult to manage. Um, it's going to be really hard to keep this person challenged. In six months, they're going to want a promotion and a salary increase. So, so again, your questions reflect what you also want in this job and company. So really think about it and, and be honest and be authentic, right, in terms of that. What about, you mentioned salary increase. Salary increase. What about just salary if it's not brought up by the recruiter or the hiring manager? I feel like a lot of candidates are uncomfortable. They always ask me, should I ask? I, my, well, I'm not even going to tell you my answer, but, and then also like work from homes come up a lot too as well now, especially with COVID-19, but just even before COVID-19, like how should, should they feel comfortable asking that? Or is that, is that too far? 
ahead it's, on the first it's call. Not at all. It's an HR question. It's definitely, I'd say it's quite the opposite, Jay. It's an HR question versus a technical interview question or a final interview question. Mm -hmm. So HR definitely has access to this information. And so asking, you know, may I inquire about the salary range of this position? Uh, can you give me an idea what it is? Because I'd like to be very honest and transparent. This is kind of where I am and, and, and kind of what I want in my next role. So mm -hmm. absolutely ask those questions. And in terms of now, be more relevant, say, you know, in terms of onboarding, as we are, you know, remote in the state of New York, um, how are you onboarding your employees right now? And what does that process look like? So that's a great question because different companies are doing absolutely different things. So I got those questions and I think that it's brilliant. So, yeah. Got it. Okay. How many, how, tell me how important the thank you is. So it's, not a deal breaker, okay. but it is important. And if you really want this job, you want to acknowledge the importance and interest. And the second thing I'd say is, make sure that your cover, your cover letter, your resume, as important as those documents are, now you have an opportunity to summarize why this conversation has made you more interested in that opportunity and why you feel you are even a better fit. And it allows you now to say if there's any additional information that you need, such as references or recommendation letters or my portfolio, it gives you an opportunity to share that additional information. So it is absolutely important and again shows initiative. Like I would want to hire someone who is communicative and has initiative and has the confidence to do so. If two two candidates are equal, one sends the thank you, one does actually, let's say one candidate is slightly stronger, doesn't send the thank you. There's another candidate you'd be happy with, but not as happy as the first one, but they sent the thank you. Which one is looked at more favorably? It's, I would say that as a neutral HR interviewer and personnel, that won't make or change anything, but it just shows us more about that person. So, you know, like a lot of people say, look, I don't know if I did very well on this test, or I don't know if I did well on one of the interviews of four people. It's a combination. We don't just look at one specific selection criteria and say, just because you did great on the test means you're an excellent candidate. It's a combination of the entire assessment process. You sending a thank you letter just reiterates your interest and reiterates our assessment that you're probably a very proactive candidate and very communicative in that regard. So, you know, it doesn't really matter at that point, but it just shows us more of who you are. Um, I haven't made a decision because one person sent a thank you email and the other person did it. Very interesting. Okay. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I just want to sort of bring it full circle. If someone sends you the thank you or they don't send you a thank you, whatever, there's a, there's a, there's a parting of ways and there's an expectation, let's say, for instance, that they'll hear back in a week and they don't when should they follow up and then how often should they follow up after that specific period of time has been <laughs> noted <laughs> i agree there's there's both there's yeah. candidates that follow up every week right and i'm like okay listen because i told them i'm like i'll get back to you when i have a response but right. it is also my um you know it's also my responsibility to tell the candidate exactly when you'll be following up so i think a question to say is not can i know about my application it's when can I know about my application? And when is the right time for me to follow up? You have that opportunity to ask that question. And so I let them know, give me about two weeks or so. And if you don't hear back from me, please do feel free to follow up with me at that time. So just be straightforward and direct and, and ask that question. But I would say that after the time that you interview, it's most likely, if you don't hear back in two weeks, you're probably not on the top of their list. Two weeks is a long time. But let's say two weeks. Yeah, I, yep. And just to sort of add some context to that, guys, I mean, the reality is, is that, and Natasha alluded to it a little bit earlier, hiring managers, the last thing that they want to do is be, is be in the recruiting process, right? This, this, this endless cycle, which, by the way, is really important for them, but they have other things that they want to be doing. And so to, if, if they're, interviewing people there's a reason for it they're interviewing people because the position is open and they want to fill it and if it goes beyond that two week period of time the likelihood is that you're going to get a little bit you know the, the probability is going to go down 
if you um if it goes beyond two weeks according to you know based on what natasha said uh if you guys are watching this on video you can see that my little <laughs> son just walked in here uh Jaylen, let me uh i'll be back with you in a minute okay um <laughs> sorry about and that. actually jay that's a great example i was talking to somebody not that it happened to me yeah. but basically did happen with a candidate where yeah. her child came in yeah. and so yeah. it's it's perfectly fine we understand that this is a new environment for us and that that's like you know, it happens all the time. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, it's. I think this is only the <laughs> second time this may have happened. I don't think. Any, I don't think anybody else was actually on it. I think I was just recording a video for my promoting this or something like that. And, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm starting to roll with it a little bit, and the door is shut, but it's not locked. Um, one final question then is: Are you hiring? You mentioned you have a bunch of places that bunch of positions you're hiring for which positions are you hiring for and how can people go about either a saying thank you to you and just sort of and, and maybe following up with some of the stuff that we talked about but also applying for the, some of these roles absolutely i i welcome linkedin messages i may not always respond immediately but i do read every linkedin message so feel free to reach out to me there um in terms of our open positions they're all on our career side we're very fortunate that we don't have hiring freezes or furloughs or pay cuts or you know, lack of bonuses this year, uh, we're doing very well as a company. And so we do want to continue to hire top talents. And so certainly look at our sales positions, uh, technology roles in different countries in North America. You know, we, we post all of those positions on LinkedIn, Indeed, ZipRecruiter, they're all out there. They're all out there. So again, if you have any interest uh, in Axiom, and even this is a great time, I'd say, Jay, to think about exploratory interviews as well, because we understand the landscape is changing and evolving right now, and we're not gonna get back to normal. It's not gonna be the same. So, so again, take this opportunity to reach out because you also may not know that I know that I have to recruit for 50 positions in the future, and if I see your background, I don't have an opening, I may still be interested in your background. So again, informational interviews and exploratory interviews, this is a fantastic time to do that. Again, make sure it's targeted to the company and the type of role that you want. Yeah, and then also guys, remember what Natasha was saying in the beginning, make sure that your resume and LinkedIn profile are robust because if it is an exploratory interview and there's something that may be not immediate now, but is going to be relevant, let's say in Q3 or something like that, and she or her team goes to pull um, you know, more profiles, um, that are relevant to to, to you, uh, you want to make sure that you're able to resurface, um, if you will, right? And like you said, timing really matters. And speaking of timing, we are out of time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I want to thank, thank you, Natasha. Um, this has been awesome. This, I've taken a bunch of notes and uh, I think people are going to get a lot out of this. Um, thank you. For thank you, Jay, as well. I really appreciate it. And if there's any other advice, um, we're all career advisors and coaches, and so we're here to get back to the community environment. We're hosting virtual sessions as a company as well uh, for different colleges and universities. And so please reach out for those opportunities and happy to engage with you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Shane. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.